This conference will now be recorded. All right, folks, so good afternoon. So we are here today and we're looking at the nervous system, chapter 13. So we took the time to talk, to watch that video because I really think that it kind of gives you a little bit of a, a foundation as far as realizing that your nervous system is extremely important as far as its ability to control the functions of the body and in cases of stress, can control it to either protect you and save your life or in, in not handling stress in a proper way can elicit panic and quite possibly could, elicit, could, could uh, result in um, you losing your life as a result of panicking in a situation where you shouldn't panic, but just handle it step by step. So the nervous system is a fascinating chapter. And we're gonna be looking at the nervous system as a overall in general this week, this uh, this week, and then next week we'll be looking at the sensory system as far as your special senses, your ability to see, your ability to hear, taste, smell. We'll be discussing that. So first slide here that we're looking at for chapter 13 is realizing that there are different types of neurons. So a neuron, a neuron is a nervous system specialized cell, a nervous system cell, right? So this specialized cell within the nervous system really is very special in that it has the ability to receive and also send out information. And I mentioned to you this before, as far as when we were looking at the muscular system, that the ability for electrical activity to take place within your body is very important in order to allow for you to have your ability to contract your skeletal muscles, as well as control all, uh, all the uh, different functions of the human body. So sensory neurons are receiving information, right? Collecting information. Interneurons are present within uh, the brain and spinal cord, and they're going to receive signals, send signals out to send up, receive some type of information, and then respond to the information that's been sent to them. And then that motor neuron is actually going to create some type of control. You'll see here muscles and glands. And this next image here shows you as far as an example of these different types of nerves, neurons present, nerve cells present within the body and how they're receiving information, sending information and working in conjunction with each other. So you'll see here that we have the sensory neuron, the interneuron, and the motor neuron, right? So we're receiving information, bringing it to the central nervous system, your brain and spinal cord, and then sending it out to the body. So the central nervous system, write this down, please. Central nervous system is the brain and the spinal cord. The brain is the controller of what's taking place within the nervous system. The spinal cord is this pathway that is going to lead information away from the brain and receiving information up to the brain. But that's called the central nervous system, your brain and spinal cord. This next image here just shows you as far as a, what's that? So this is called a motor neuron, and it's a multi, actually, sorry, not motor, a multi-polar neuron. Multipolar neuron. And what's going on, folks, is that this multipolar neuron has a bunch of different parts to it, and you're going to have to learn some of those parts. So it's a nerve cell, this multipolar neuron, and it has these smaller structures here called dendrites, a larger structure here called an axon, okay? So here we have the neuron cell body, see it says cell body. We have these dendrites, they look like branches. Then we have this one big branch that's coming off of that cell body. That's called an axon. These dendrites, these little branches, 
and there's the neuron cell body. So the cell body is going to receive input via the dendrites. The dendrites are bringing information to the cell body. Write that down. The dendrites are bringing information to the cell body, the dendrites. The dendrites are bringing information to the cell body. The axon is taking information away from the cell body. So this is going to actually allow for your muscles to contract because of the electrical input that's being sent down to that axon, to the area where the muscle and the nerve meet, chemicals are gonna be released, and we're gonna have the ability to then contract the muscles of the skeletal system, the skeletal muscles your conscious control over them. So dendrites are receiving information. The axon is sending information away. The axon is going to glands muscles, okay? To make them do something. You're also gonna see here that on this axon, see those like little pieces of gum? See how those pieces look like little pieces of gum here, right? These little pieces are called myelin. Myelin. How many of you have heard of the, the disease multiple sclerosis? You've probably heard of it, right? And so multiple sclerosis causes damage to the myelin. That's a bad thing. It's called a demyelinating disorder. Look up at the wires up in the ceiling here. Take a look at these wires. These wires up here, they used to go through a, uh, a projector that would send your picture right to on a screen. What's on those wires? What's around it? What's, what's on it? What's covering it? Really? Some kind of insulated. So it's plastic or rubber, right? but they're insulated. So it's not just that you have a wire. Look over here. We've got all these wires here, right? They're insulated. They're not just clear wire, okay? Well, that axon, in this case, it's not bare. It's covered in this myelin. So myelin is an insulator. So write that down next to myelin. It insulates. It insulates. And it allows for there to be faster conduction of the electrical activity that's going on. So it makes things go faster. Communication, fast, right? Very fast. If I touch something hot, does my hand stay on the thing that's hot? No, what happens? It moves away very quickly. It does that because of myelin present on those axons that create very fast communication, okay? So we've got the dendrite. It's receiving information, sending it to the cell body, right? What's that big dot here? That's the nucleus. That's the nucleus of that cell, that big dot. So that's the, that's the, the uh, neuron cell body. Then you've got the axon, which is going to be sending information to a muscle or a gland, okay? And that's gonna cause some type of change to take place at the end of that axon. So the next slide here shows you that neurons, nerve cells, are excitable. That's a big deal. They respond to stimuli or a stimulus, okay? And they respond to it by producing an electric, electrical signal. It's called an action potential. I call it bioelectricity. Think about this, that your body can produce this electricity within, okay? To allow for your muscles to receive information from the nervous system so that they can work, okay? So that's important. 
you'll see here this term it says resting neuron they have these channels okay so in the case of neurons there's going to be movement of substances like sodium and potassium that are going to create a situation that will allow for electricity to be produced. It's kind of weird, but that's just how the body works. You'll see here that the cytoplasm, it's the guts present within the cell. So the quick look here at this class. Uh, Those of you online, I'll show you the model in just one moment. But take a look at this model of a cell. Right? So this would be the nucleus. That's the nucleus, right? Then we have all the guts, all the everything else that's inside of the cell. What well, we call this the cytoplasm. Cytoplasm, right? The guts of the cell it contains all the organelles, these little tiny structures that are analogous or similar to an organ present within here, right? Nucleus cytoplasm okay so let me show the online class all right folks so you're seeing here we have a cell here's the nucleus and all the cytoplasm with its all structures that are present within the cell so it says here on our slide cytoplasm next to the membrane is more negative than the fluid outside the membrane so Here's the drill that I'm going to talk to you about right now. There's a little bit of what we would call polarity. If something is polar, it means that there's a difference in one area than the other. Okay? You ever heard of like opposites attract? Right? Well, in the case of what's going on outside of the cell or inside of the cell, close to this structure here, you know what that's called? This outer part? <coughs> the plasma membrane. So those of you online, this outer part of the cell, it's called the plasma membrane, okay? And you'll see here that outside of the plasma membrane, it's a little bit positive. Inside of the plasma membrane, right, the covering, it's a little bit negative. Close to that covering of the cell. That plasma membrane, it just keeps all this, the contents of the cell inside, in place, right? Um, you ever see a, a jello mold where someone's made a jello mold and they've put, they've thrown in some like uh, nuts, like walnuts and some fruit inside of it, and you've got this jello, uh, kind of like a little bit similar to what goes on as far as the cell. There's movement that takes place within inside of the cell, okay? And, and know that. Again, like I said, this polarity is important in order to produce electrical activity, produce electrical signals. Okay. Hey, how everybody in the class here, we got another 20 minutes. Let's stand up, please stand up, stretch it out a little bit. I don't want you to get tired and sleepy. Stretch it out a little bit first. Stretch it out a bit. Take a look at this next slide as you're doing that. So take a look here. And what you're seeing here, folks, is that this on the left, in the upper left corner, this is showing you this multipolar neuron. And you're seeing here the plasma membrane. This little weird thing right there, that's called the plasma membrane. So here, this is the plasma membrane. It's over here. And on the bottom, you can see these little things here. Those are channels. Those are channels. A channel is like a door. A channel is like a door that's closed. A channel is like a door that's closed, and then something can happen in order to open the channel and allow for material to go back and forth. Okay? That's important. But there has to be some type of key that unlocks the channel that allows for it to be open and something go in and out. Right? So substances can go in and out of the cell, okay? So substances can go in and out of this nerve cell. Through those channels, I'll give you one more thing here. 
See this one right here? These two right here in the middle? Those of you online, these two right here, they're always open. They're called a leak channel. Write this down, please, go to the classroom. That's called a leak, a leak channel. You can have to see leak channel. They're always open. So that's the one type of channel, that's the one type of channel that doesn't have a gate, doesn't have a door. They're always open. But these other ones right here and right here are gated channels and they specifically will allow for right here and right here, they'll only allow for substances to move because something's gonna happen and allow, allow that to do that. And there's gonna be something that's gonna open or close or allow closure of that gate, that door to allow movement of material. One more thing I wanna to say to you about this is that you see how there's a K and there's an NA? So NA represents sodium, write that down. NA is sodium, the K is potassium. So I'll write it on the board. Na Na is sodium and the K is potassium. And I believe it's the Greek that they're taking the K for this as far as it's calium, calium. Yeah, so that's why they use the K. But you'll see on this image here, outside of the cell, inside of the cell. So what else, we can use words to describe this. We can say, write this down, intracellular and extra cellular. So intracellular, extracellular has to do with intracellular inside of the cell, extracellular outside of the cell. Intracellular inside of the cell, extracellular outside of the cell. So the bottom line, folks, is that we there needs to be an understanding that what's taking place outside of the cell is a little bit different than what's taking place inside of the cell. And because of this difference from outside and inside, it creates this, what we would say, this polarity and this allowance for then changes to take place so that electrical activity can be produced and we can communicate with the organs communicate with the glands, with the muscles of the human body via the nervous system. These next slide here, it says a nerve impulse. So when I've talked about, when I've mentioned to you, when I've mentioned to you regarding that, that electrical activity, that electrical activity is that, oh, there you go, that nerve impulse. There's a change that's taking place on this plasma membrane, the covering of the cell and the covering of the axon. It's gonna change, it's gonna reverse. When it does that, it's gonna produce this electricity this electrical event. So an action potential, when we talk about this nerve impulse, we can call it an action potential. And this action potential is always going away from the cell on the axon. So the action potential 
the action potential, or you could put the term the AP for an abbreviation, that action potential, that action potential is this nerve impulse that travels away from the neuron cell body down the axon. And it's going to go to a skeletal muscle or a gland. It's important for you to know. But it's going to go someplace in order to create some type of reaction. Nerve impulse, it's electricity. It's the body's electricity. So it's we, we could say it's bioelectricity. That nerve impulse. Bio electricity and it's going away from the neuron cell body and this is how we have the control over the muscles of your body as far as the skeletal muscles that move your skeleton Now, on this page here, I'm not really going to ask you to give me any information regarding this other than just knowing that, again, we're at a level that you're not non -sci you're non science major, so I'm teaching you to give you information, but not overwhelming you with information. So the nervous system is overwhelming. A neurosurgeon, they're like the rock stars as far as medical doctors are concerned. Understanding neurology and how the nervous system and the brain function it's pretty heavy stuff. I'm giving you neurology light. I'm giving you a little bit of information to help you understand a little bit about how the nervous system, how the brain, the spinal cord, the nerves, they all work. So just know that the changes that take place on that plasma membrane, remember I said that it kind of reverses, it'll go from positive to negative and negative to positive, that will produce this electricity. Well, it's in the event wants to, over time, go back to it, be restored to its resting position, its resting potential, or it's positive on the outside, negative on the inside, okay? And so there are different pumps, there are different channels that are opened or closed that allow for sodium and potassium to move. And that's the big key here, folks, is that sodium and potassium are both outside of the cell and inside of the cell at different concentrations, at different levels, right? And uh, when they move, they create change, which in turn can produce this electricity. Okay? That's what I want you to know. And that's what these next two couple of slides here are just showing you. You can look at them. And I want to show you that. I'm not asking you to you know, just like memorize and spit that back out to me. But realizing that, yeah, this is good that there's going to be a time where the electricity is going to be produced and then it's going to return back to its resting levels. So you're going to have a situation where it's a little bit positive on the outside, a little bit negative on the inside. It's going to then create that electricity and then go back to return to its resting level. That's what I want you to know. From. So it's really just a matter of that that plasma membrane changes take place, sodium and potassium are moving, and it creates this change that can produce this electrical event, okay? Now, here you'll see that it says, action potentials stimulate neurons to release neurotransmitters. Well, folks, we talked about this when we were talking about the muscular system. See that term right there, acetylcholine? That's that neurotransmitter, that nerve chemical that is released in order for muscle contraction to take place, okay? But we have other ones, epinephrine, norepinephrine. Write this down, folks. Adrenaline. Adrenaline. Well, that's the same thing. It's also known as epinephrine, okay? 
Have you ever heard of someone who's very allergic to maybe bee stings and such? They might carry an EpiPen. What does an EpiPen contain? Epinephrine. So it's very important. It can save someone's life when they're going through a anaphylactic shock, a very extreme form of shock that they can die from if they're not uh, treated. Now you'll see here that, let's focus on this here. Neurotransmitters can excite or inhibit a receiving cell. So that's important to know that they can either cause something to happen or prevent something from happening, okay? We'll be looking at, after we look at the special senses, we'll be covering and, and reviewing, going over the endocrine system. The nervous system, very quick type control over what takes place. If I touch something hot, whoa, I move my hand away very quickly. That's very fast. The endocrine system, we talked about like thyroid hormone, growth hormone, estrogen, testosterone, progesterone. These are all hormones, folks, that will allow for things to take place and they have a longer lingering effect. So they may not be as quick acting. Now, epinephrine, norepinephrine, we'll call them neurohormones. They do act very quickly. But most hormones, takes a while for them to react, but then it causes a, a reaction that can take place over an extended period of time. And that's a good thing. So here you're just seeing this next image here. You're seeing where we have events that are taking place at the neuromuscular junction, at the nerve muscle junction. So this represents the muscle. And that's that nerve muscle junction, that neuromuscular junction where the nerve and the muscle meets and it doesn't touch, but we can send chemicals out that are going to cause things to happen where we're going to have a muscle contraction. So let's look at this next slide here. I think you'll find this interesting. So take a look at this next slide. You're seeing acetylcholine. We talked about that earlier. That's the one. For the muscles, right? For the skeletal muscles to contract, that's the chemical that's released. Also, can affect mood and memory, acetylcholine. Epinephrine, norepinephrine, speeds the heart rate, dilates the pupils. So here's the thing. Your pupils will dilate under a sympathetic response, under a fight or flight, preparing the body for action type reaction because we want to have those pupils as wide open as possible to take in as much light as possible so that you can see what's going on and protect yourself. Pupillary constriction, when the pupil gets small, that's as a result of what? That's as a result of like a light flashes in your eye and your pupils will contract, okay? They get smaller. So epinephrine, norepinephrine, or we could call it adrenaline, right? Speeds the heart rate, dilates the pupils, dilates the airways, so we have more air entering into the lungs. It slows GI contractions and it will increase anxiety. So when you're stressed out and you're having a, an, an anxiety attack, right? Or you're at a, you're taking a test, you're going for an inter job interview, anxiety, right? So part of it is that stress response, this epinephrine can be contributing to in norepinephrine. And it slows the GI contractions because really, when you're under a serious situation where you have to prepare your body to run or to fight, would it make sense for your body to start having uh, digestion taking place? No, right? So as a result, that, that's inhibited. Remember I said to you earlier, we have either stimulation or inhibition taking place in the nervous system as far as control is concerned. All right, so we have a couple more uh, hormones here. So dopamine. So dopamine, remember I, I talked to you about dopamine and serotonin, I said to you that. So dopamine, think about as far as uh, aiding in the whole um, pleasure response. So reduces excite, ex, excitatory effects of other neurotransmitters, roles in memory learning, fine motor coordination, 
and also this whole um if you so like think of addiction dopamine think of addiction if you do something whether it's pornography whether it's a drug it's an alcohol whatever it may be that's gonna that's going you're gonna take in and once you do it the body releases dopamine and says hey you know this feels good and continue doing this right this kind of reinforces what goes on as far as someone who has an addictive situation behavior serotonin on the other hand can deal with mood in particular so elevating mood rolling memory and learning also but serotonin can also be situations that can be correlated with um, depression and such low levels is issues with that serotonin and GABA GABA right inhibits the release of other neurotransmitters instead of stimulate stimulatory it in, it's inhibitory so these are these neurotransmitters or nerve chemicals okay now you'll see here that next slide neuromodulators can cause they can amplify they can make and increase the effect or dampen the effect of a neurotransmitter okay so interesting that endorphins inhibit nerves from releasing substance p so if you worked out you're running whatever it is the activity that you're doing but you're doing it and you're you're doing it for an extended period of time this can help release the body's natural pain relievers these endorphins that will help to inhibit the pain response so have you ever heard someone who was playing a sport and they got injured and they still kept on playing the sport and were able to do that even with a you know an injury or how about people who are in combat and they get shot multiple times and their body is still able to do what it needs to do in order to help others or to keep on fighting that's the body's pain relievers these natural pain relievers these natural analgesics that are being released endorphins and kephalons are another one they inhibit the nerves from releasing substance p substance p has to do with the pain response simple enough that's why they use the term p right the letter p for pain response so inhibiting pain experienced now one last thing and then we'll take a break neurotransmitter molecules must be removed from the synapse so remember i said that the synapse is the area where some kind of communication is taking place between a nerve and another nerve or a nerve in a muscle or a nerve in a gland right well we can't always have the chemicals being released and being there they have to be released and then taken back up and then when needed, released again, taken back up. So this is important. So they have to be removed from that area where there's communication. So it's not always continual communication. In the case of, of, of uh, addiction, so there are certain types of uh, drugs that will allow for chemicals, these neurotransmitters to be released and be released much more than what they normally are. And this will create a situation initially that the person who's getting high, like, whoa, this feels really good. I'm enjoying this. And it's giving me more than what I would normally experience without the drug. But what happens over time is that too much of this chemical is being released. The neurotransmitters are releasing too much and it overwhelms the body. You need more of the drug to experience a high. And also there comes a point where it's not even going to make much of a difference. And then they do end up having enough drug to make them high. But it can also lead to an overdose and the pa person passes away all right so i mean not to end on like a down note but just honestly right <laughs> but 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 know that like neurotransmitters these nerve chemicals they're important it's how the body communicates it's how the body allows for you to do the processes that you do to stay alive and to maintain remember this term homeostasis a stable environment within your body no matter what goes on outside of your body Okay, so these nerve chemicals are really important. So it's the, the bioelectricity, those action potentials, as well as these nerve chemicals that are really important for the body to do what it needs to do and for the nervous system to be able to control what happens with the body. All right, we're gonna take a break. So folks online, I'm gonna turn us, shut us down for about 15 minutes and we'll return. So at 325, we'll start.
I'm going to stop sharing. This. I'll keep this. Yeah. Yeah, I won't share the screen. All right. All right, folks. So we'll be back in uh, 15 minutes.
All right, folks, we'll start in just one minute. So folks, I kept it recording. I should have stopped it and then kept it, turned it back on again. I apologize. So those of you that are going to be watching this video later, there's going to be about a 15 minute, 18 minute pause. So uh, break in between. Sorry about that. All right, folks. So let's come back to uh, the PowerPoints. We'll finish up here with what we want to do today. <clears throat> so what you'll see here is that Nerves traveling long distances. Well, we get this because we realize that we can control what goes on on our fingertips or in our, at our toes, right? So nerves can travel a long distance from one area to another. But you'll see here that the simplest of nerve pathways, the reflexes, don't directly involve the brain. I've talked to you multiple times regarding that if you touch something hard, if you touch something that's sharp, what's gonna happen? Right away, you'll remove your hand because it's hot, because it's sharp, because your body does not want you to, you know, it, it's gonna elicit this reflex, it's withdrawal reflex. Go ahead, please. Yeah, so what a shame, right? So that's really, you would think, if there's no pain receptors, that would be a good thing. No, because honestly, folks, um, pain receptors keep you from hurting yourself further in yourself. Those of though there are people that suffer from. You probably heard this before. The term leprosy. Have you ever heard of leprosy? It's also known as Hansen's disease. This is a situation where it affects the peripheral nervous system, and they do not have that sensations that you and I would feel when we touch something. And as a result, it can make them um, to the point where they damage their fingers, their toes, their face and such. And so it's really a, not a good thing. So having pain, re pain receptors is a good thing. It's just that if you're experiencing chronic pain, it's no fun, right? And so that's what I spent my career working with people with pain. It's tough. If you've ever, you've, we've, all, we've all here have experienced some level of pain. And sometimes it's been pretty uncomfortable. You ever have a bad toothache or a bad backache? Oh, that's no fun, right? Um, so pain is no fun, but pain short term can be a positive thing and a good thing, right? So the reflexes, and so that's genetic. That's genetic, yeah. So that's for whatever has gone on as far as in her body that that's not allowing and producing and receiving. That's that's a shame to be honest. Do, do you know how old? Uh, she is. And you saw it on YouTube? Yeah. Maybe share the link with me if you get a chance. Yeah, if you do, please do. Yeah. So reflexes are very important, very quick. And what happens with the reflex is that your body will, will do something very quickly as a result of this reflex, protecting you. And then afterwards, your brain will know that, hey, that was sharp, that was hot, that was whatever and I moved away from it, but if your brain is receiving it second after the spinal cord, so what happens is that the nervous system works very quickly to send information to the spinal cord and then back to the muscle in order to create that fast reaction. You'll see here that the baby's rooting reflex. Have you ever seen a little baby and you've touched it and you touch it on the cheek 
what will it do when you touch it on the cheek? It's going to go towards that stimulation because that would be like the stimulation of the mom being near the child and wanting to breastfeed, right? Feed the child. It's going to then go to root to that area where the food would be. That's that rooting reflex. There are other types of reflexes also that uh, babies will ex exhibit because their immune system, uh, their nervous system, as well as their immune system, their nervous system is immature. And so it needs to uh, mature and develop as time goes on. <clears throat> so the brain and spinal cord, brain and spinal cord, that's your central nervous system. <clears throat> Give me one moment, folks. I just want to look at something here. All right, so what you're seeing here, folks, is just as we were looking at, as we were looking at, yeah, here we go. As we were looking at the muscular system and seeing how there's bundles of structures that make up the skeletal muscle, well, you'll see here, as far as nerves are concerned, there are also bundles present of structures, okay? And in particular, you're seeing at the bottom here, right here, that you're looking at an axon in yellow, and you're seeing that special types of cells that are myelin that allow for insulation. Now, I want you to know that not all nerves, not all axons present within the nervous system are myelinated, but the ones that go to the skeletal muscle, they are myelinated, they are insulated, and that's important for you to know. Here you're seeing this next slide. This next slide shows you that how a reflex works and it goes right to the spinal cord. So this area right here, this is a cross section of the spinal cord, this image right here. So this part right here is a cross section of the spinal cord. Now look at this, what's going on. So a fruit, look at A here, a fruit is being loaded into a bowl, which puts weight on an arm muscle and stretches it. Will the, will the bowl drop? So if you're put, putting, if you're holding onto a bowl, someone starts putting a couple of fruit within the bowl. If you're healthy and normal, it's not going to drop to the floor. You're going to be able to hold on to it and your muscles will adapt to the added weight. So no, because the muscle spindles, these are special right here. This structure right here present within skeletal muscle will allow for sending an information to the, the spinal cord that, hey, the muscles are being stretched. The stretching will stimulate sensory receptors in that muscle spindle, sending electricity to the spinal cord. So you see here, electricity, that bioelectricity is traveling up to the spinal cord. At the other area, there's going to be communication here, synapse, and then a response to that stretching. What's the response? The bicep will contract and more muscle fibers will contract in that biceps in order to not drop the bowl of the fruit, but be able to adapt to the added weight. Okay, that's a response. That's a that's a, a reflex that's taking place. A stretch reflex, we would call it. Now, take a look at this next image. We'll just do a couple of images in the PowerPoint, and then we'll be a couple of slides, and then we'll be uh, done for the day. I said to you that the central nervous system is composed of the brain and the spinal cord. You see that there already. So what will then the peripheral nervous system? Sorry about that. Yep. So then the peripheral nervous system is all else, all the other components. So there are 31 pairs of spinal nerves. You need to know that. There are 12 pairs of cranial nerves. So the spinal nerves come directly off of the spine. The cranial nerves come directly off of the brain. 
And this term here, afferent and efferent, you do need to know these terms. Afferent signals are coming toward, so in the case of the nervous system, or in the case of like the dendrites, the dendrites are bringing afferent information. We would use that term afferent and efferent. Afferent coming towards the nervous system, so the brain spinal cord. Afferent, as far as the dendrites, bringing information to that neuron cell, the neuron cell body. Efferent is, so afferent you could say would be sensory. So write that down next to it. Afferent, A-F-F-E-R-E-N-T, because you can get this confused. Afferent is sensory, it's bringing information to. Efferent is motor. There's some type of response that's going to be taken away and going to a gland, a muscle, okay? That's efferent. Sure. So afferent, A-F-F, the A one, that's sensory, sensory input. Efferent is motor output. So efferent, E-F-F-E-R-E-N-T, motor output. Or how about in the case of the axon? The axon carries information, what, away, so it's efferent. The axon is efferent. E-F-F-E-R-E-N-T. It's taking information away from the neuron cell body. So we have sensory input, motor output. Sensory input is afferent. Motor output is efferent, E-F-F, -F, okay? That can be a little confusing. Now you'll see here where it says in the peripheral nervous system that there are pairs. 31 pairs of spinal nerves, 12 pairs of cranial nerves, because they're what? They're on both sides. Right side, left side, both sides, bilateral. That's the pairs. So there's a right side and left side for each of those spinal nerves exiting off of the spinal cord from the spine itself, being protected by the spine. 12 pairs of cranial nerves pass through holes and openings in the skull. So understand this, that your ability to smell is the olfactory nerve, and that's cranial nerve number one. Your ability to see cranial nerve number two, the optic nerve. That's just giving you a couple. But those are cranial nerves. They come directly off of the brain and they go to more than likely some type of special process <coughs> related to what's going on in the head. Although, although there are some nerves that will go down towards the rest of the body, like cranial nerve number 10, the vagus nerve. So again, cranial nerves come directly off of the brain. Spinal nerves come directly off of the spinal cord and go to all the parts of the body. So this is a good image for you to be aware of. And it just reinforces the whole afferent efferent. Sensory input, afferent. Motor output, efferent, E-F-F-E-R-E-N-T. Now this next image here, just gives you an idea as far as what's going on with the breakdown of another couple of terms. We know we're gonna look at here at the somatic and the autonomic. And the somatic you can think of controlling skeletal muscle. So your skeletal muscles, you think about it, you do. That controls those muscles. They're, they're voluntary, we would say. That's somatic part of the system. The autonomic, write this down, is automatic. The autonomic is automatic. You don't consciously control. It's involuntary. Autonomic is involuntary. It's automatic. Okay. And this is what I've talked to you about a couple of times today regarding 
sympathetic and parasympathetic. When I talked about sympathetic and parasympathetic, you see here, sympathetic, parasympathetic. What's going on there? Sympathetic, it prepares the body for action. I'm gonna do something, I'm gonna run, I'm going to fight, whatever it is, I'm gonna do some type of action. Or how about if I'm at the doctor's office and I'm waiting for a test result that could be very bad? Or how about if I'm going on a job interview? Or if I'm stressed out at my work? These are all like sympathetic type of situations that can occur where it kind of jacks your body up, your blood pressure goes up, not good, not healthy. Short term, a sympathetic response is healthy. Long term, sympathetic response, your body can't handle that. People have like high blood pressure and some other issues that go on, um, weight issues and such. Sympathetic control is over, it's dominating instead of this parasympathetic. This parasympathetic, that's just a normal response of how you live your life day to day without any type of stress. Parasympathetic control. Sympathetic, you're stressed out. Sympathetic, things are going on and you you really you're anxious and you, you can't control things short term like i said going for a job interview taking a test sympathetic control this next image here shows you as far as the nervous system you'll see here the brain the spinal cord and the nerves that exit off of the spinal cord so you're seeing here that we have these spinal nerves, bilateral, both sides, 31 pairs, right? 12 pairs of cranial nerves. You see here that somatic nerves, they're involved in control of the skeletal muscle. Somatic nerves control the skeletal muscle. They're voluntary, right? You control that. Autonomic nerves, right? These are going to areas of the body that you do not have control over. Involuntary. Involuntary, autonomic, automatic. Bless you. So the autonomic, Go to the organs, all the internal structures and such. Sympathetic, parasympathetic. We would say divisions. Again, parasympathetic, it's under calm control of the body. Sympathetic, fight or flight. You're, you're stressed out. You have to do something, preparing the body for action. Sympathetic. And they all carry exciting and inhibiting type signals to the organs. Parasympathetic would be to calm things down with your body. So blood pressure, this would help to calm your body down. Your heart rate, calm the body down, it's parasympathetic. Exciting, sympathetic response. That adrenaline, sympathetic response, it's released. I'm going to go over the next three slides, two slides and one slide with an image, and then we'll be done for the day. Here we go. So the hindbrain, we can also call it the brain stem and the cerebellum. So that medulla oblongata with its structures there that, that are present. Um, we think of the brainstem when we're thinking of that area, that region. The cerebellum is at the base of your skull, and it's more of a different, we'll go over it as far as the anatomical structures in a lab. But you'll see here the medulla oblongata, if this is damaged, you'll die. So this is really important to protect, and this is protected by the skull. And then we have an extension, right, that will go to the, um, that will be an extension of the uh, hindbrain would be the spinal cord itself. So you'll see here that the medulla, breathing rhythm. So your respiratory rate,
your heart rate, right? Your pulse, your the ability for your, your heart to beat, your um, blood pressure, medulla oblongata, many other things, but that's key. Voluntary movements, um, your ability to uh, have your balance, cerebellum. The midbrain, this is just a little bit deeper and further from the medulla. And this midbrain, right, relays information. So really what's happening is that through the medulla, information is going up to the brain and then coming away from the brain. The forebrain, your cerebrum or your cerebral hemispheres. These will process information. And again, we'll, we'll talk about this more in the lab on Thursday. So the cerebral hemispheres, the forebrain, the midbrain, uh, dealing with uh, different structures <coughs> that I'm not asking you to know as far as the peduncles and the pons. We'll, we'll talk about that, but there's certain things you won't have to memorize. You'll see here that there is a covering of the brain. A covering of the brain. They're called the meninges. Right? You might have heard of this term before. Right? And so there's these coverings, these meninges, and they're connective tissue. That's a speci special type of tissue that they would be. And they're they're depending upon the layer of covering, there's three layers, and so they'll be protective of the brain. You'll see here that cerebrospinal fluid, CSF. This is a fluid that's present within spaces within the brain and spinal cord and within an area of the meninges between the coverings. And then the blood brain barrier, this is a way for the uh, body to protect the brain from direct interaction with certain organisms, certain types of ways to protect it from getting sick, certain types of. Uh, um, substances and such. So you'll see here that so water and fat soluble substances cross the barrier freely because the brain needs water, the brain needs fat. It's important. Okay. But others, you'll see here, transport proteins regulate other molecules movement. And not everything can pass this blood brain barrier. Have you ever heard of the the uh the disease of Parkinson's disease? So Parkinson's disease patients will have these tremors. And then they'll have issues with like their face. They won't have much of a, what we call a blank affect. There's not a whole lot of like um, facial expression taking place. Go ahead. Yeah. And that's the blood brain barrier working because a percentage of the, of the medication will enter into the brain, uh, dopamine, but a good percentage will not. And so even though you can take this medication, it's still, yeah, because over time the body, the brain, the body will adapt to the medication, and it won't because it's a disease process. So it's definitely a degenerative type disease process. Yeah, it's very sad. Yeah, Parkinson's is, is not an easy one. Many times it's a slow moving process, and it won't kill the patient, but it'll absolutely make their life miserable over time. All right, so only certain substances can actually pass that blood brain barrier. And lastly here, I just want to show you this image of the meninges. And we'll stop here at this part of the slide presentation. But you can just see here that we've got the scalp, we've got the bone, the skull, and then we've got layers of coverings, OK? Uh, the pia, the arachnoid, and then the dura mater. So the dura is the outermost. The arachnoid is the middle. And it kind of looks a little bit like webby. That's why they would say arachnoid, right, for, for spider web. So dura is the outer, arachnoid is the middle, and the pia mater is the inner layer. And these coverings will help to protect the brain. And you'll see here, also in this image, if you look at the blue, the blue here would represent the cerebral spinal fluid and such that's actually the blue are the, the ventricles and cerebral spinal fluid will flow through these areas. Sorry. Cerebral spinal fluid will flow through these areas here and here and in through and here, as well as around and covering and can penetrate deep within the brain. So in this space in through and here, 
which are in this case here, covering the brain, protecting the brain, and actually helping to clear products of waste as when you sleep. Superior spinal fluid will do that also. All right, folks, very good. So we're going to stop recording today and we'll finish up on Thursday.